everybody. There we go. All right. Now it's just starting to load up now. Here we go. Everybody. The computer's going to link up to the folks here. Da, da, da. Because we're you and I are live, and now this computer is going to catch up. One second, there's about a ten, ten second delay. There it goes. Click it in. Now there's now there's advertising. That's how we make money. There's advertising in front of all the ads. All right. You there we go. Let me there we go. <laughs> how are we doing now, guys? Look, we are back live. Can you hear us now? Mm -mm -mm -mm. There we go. We got thinking here's now. There we go. Let's do this all again. Hey, it's Julie Scarkina. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out. Technical difficulties all taken care of. Can't wait for you guys to meet Julie because you guys have seen her on TV. She's been on with Jay Leno. She's been on Good Morning America. Jack Hanna. She was on the Jack Hanna for years. She's traveled all over the world. I've known Julie for, I don't know, 30 plus years. Yeah. Um, we used to play softball together with her husband. Her husband Don's a great guy. And we're going to jump right in. Thanks for coming out, guys. Appreciate it. Um, Julie Scardina, where'd you grow up? We always start, where, where'd you grow up? Well, for the first eight years of my life, I'm a, I'm a, actually a native Illinoisan. Is that a word? Ah. Um, but yeah, so I was born near Chicago and we lived there until my mom found out that there were places in the United States that were a lot warmer. And then <laughs> we moved to California and, and uh, it all you know, took hold from there. Well, uh, some of our loyal viewers are from Chicago. I call them my goombas from Chicago. Chris <laughs> and Rick, Mary and Jimmy. So let's, you talked talk about your parents. I go, we always honor everybody's parents. What are your parents' names and what do they do growing up? Uh, well, um, Sylvester was my dad, and he uh, he he was on the Italian side, right? So you know, he wasn't he wasn't. The Scardinas. You know, yeah, but he, he didn't seem too Italian, but he definitely looked Italian. Um, <laughs> he, he was an engineer, and unfortunately, he passed when I was about 12. So mm. I had 12 fantastic years. He was a wonderful person, um, very intelligent, and, um, you know, kind of probably gave me my interest in, believe it or not, like investments and making sure I ah. had things with money, which is why I was able to retire and, and enjoy life and do what I wanted, you know, so. That's um, just important. So, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry to say that again. It's a, it's very important. But Ellen and I are in the same boat. We, we had some smart advice when we were younger and we're now we're ready to go. I can retire at 59. There you go. That's exactly yeah. What, yeah. And and it's yeah, it's a, it's so important as you said to put away money and and be prepared yeah. for, you know, the years when you're not wanting to work. <laughs> uh, and, and then your mom? My, my mom is uh Dolores Catherine Scardina and uh, um, she did a fantastic job of raising us after my dad passed. Uh, I basically have to, you know, give her credit for everything that I've mm. been able to do in my life. She's also an animal lover. So, um, wow. so I was not super close to my mom until she actually moved in with us. And fortunately, I had about 15 years with her at the okay. end of her wow. life. So she passed uh, about a year and a half ago and still miss oh. her every day because she lived with us. And yeah. I was really, really uh, privileged, happy, and and so fulfilled to be there for her every day at the end. So you mentioned your mom was an animal lover. Was that, was that, was how that influenced you? Because you your career path is amazing. And was your mom an influence on that when you were younger? Um, I, I would probably have to say that, you know, whether that was an influence through genetics, I don't know if that happens that way, but I knew I wanted to work with animals since I can remember because wow. I was a girl who I didn't want to play with dolls. Uh, I was always in jeans. I was always outdoors and yeah. all of my toys were, you know, like um, animal, you know, figurines or, uh, you know, horses. I loved horses for a long period of time. And, oh. and so, you know, that, that was just a part of me and it's always been a part of who I am. 
So that never changed from when I get, like I said, I mean, I was two years old playing with um, only, you know, only the dogs and the horses and the wow. things that people would give me to, to play with. Never wanted to play with dolls. It's interesting because you, you you make that decision as a young person and who knew what it's, it was going to take you all over the world? I mean, all over the world and meet so many places. I can't wait to get into your story. You had to say you had a sibling. It's your sibling's name. Uh, Vince is my brother, two years older. Uh, again, you know, kind of uh, definitely got the brains uh, from my dad and the family. You know, I, I have to work hard to succeed. Uh, no. Know, he's just a natural at it, but uh, super <laughs> nice guy. Um, just a, a really a rock of the family, and I love him to death. So as you're growing up, you went to high school in San Diego or are you still in the Chicago area? Uh, no, I went to high school in Agora, which is um, a place north. I lived in Westlake. Uh, north oh, okay. Of LA. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah. So, so Julie and I's connection, full of slow, Julie and I's connection, Julie and I met at SeaWorld in the 80s. Um, I've been there since 85, and I'm getting ready to call my career. Julie started, what year did you start at SeaWorld? Mm, do I have to admit it? <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't have to. You can just say 80 or a decade I'll if you want the, to. The late, how about the late 70s? I'll say it then. Okay, yeah. that's okay. That's okay. Believe it, or, believe it or not. I was very young, actually, when I started. I did, I, and that's not necessarily a, 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 a misdirection there, because I did start when I was 19 as a trainer. Yeah, I started at 19 in, uh, in the water quality. Sir, I worked directly with her to, as a young kid trying to find my way in the world, didn't know what I was going to do. I got hurt playing college baseball and I said, I need to find a career. And I got a job at SeaWorld at some job fair, putting price tags on t-shirts back in the day. And I said, I don't want to babysit high school kids my whole life. And I got Michael Tucker, who you know very well, um, got me a job working and get a trade. And I learned from the ground up and now I'm running the entire department. So things, you know, things make happen, you know, you make it happen. So Julie spent time with so many animals at SeaWorld, but she also was one of the uh, main killer whale trainers and she did a lot of the theatrics back in those days and times have changed and we've gotten different directions though they have talk about your experience at SeaWorld. Oh well you know SeaWorld has virtually been my whole career. Um mm. I mean I and, and even beforehand obviously I visited before I worked there. When I visited SeaWorld I also had visited many other oceanariums, other zoological facilities and we're talking about again the late 70s when I was um, in college and, and trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do. And SeaWorld was the top of the game. You know, they had the best facilities, they had the best um, care and, and yeah. veterinary services and all of that. So basically I said, I want to work at SeaWorld. And it was, I, I mean, I just called myself fortunate to have, you know, after I applied, I, I got the job. Like I said, I was very young. I learned on the job. Finished my schooling at San Diego State. That's and, right. And, uh, and then just stuck with it, you know, worked hard. And, and as they say, you know, if it's your passion, you're, you're, you're not working a day in your life. Absolutely. And so I was there. I left for a couple of years, worked for the Navy for a couple of years, training animals um, uh, with a, you know, contract. And and then went back to SeaWorld, kind of became the ambassador soon after that, and the rest is history. Uh, you you skim over that so fast. So when you left for the Navy, the SAIC program, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, they have a, where they train. S it, it wasn't SAIC at the time, but it did change to SAIC. Yeah. So um, what they did was they trained dolphins. It, this current thing, they trained dolphins to hunt landmines and, and and not landmines, but underwater mines and direct traffic for. They're very smart, and you got to be part of that program, but. I want to make sure I don't want to leave this guy out. When did you meet Don, your husband? So, you know, you mentioned softball at SeaWorld and it was co-ed softball at the time. Yeah. And and so, you know, I, I was always wanting to be active. I Like I said, I always wanted to be outdoors. So there was a bunch of guys on the team. Now, I, yes. Bubba, I, Bubba, I am going to admit this publicly, although Don may not appreciate it, but I did not remember Don being on the team. So, <laughs> but, but let me just say, let, let me say, he was married. So I think I just—that's oh, right. 
you know, I just, I kind of, you know, and what, what I, what he reminds me of is he helped me with my batting and I kind of now think back, Oh, that was him, you know? So I kind of remember that now. So <laughs> it wasn't until uh, he was separated from his wife that we kind of, you know, was okay, because he was VP of entertainment at yeah. World, and yeah. I was, you know, running Dolphin at the time. So we had these interactions, which were actually more um, uh, conflict related because as, as, as entertainment guy, he wanted me to like spend more time doing ta-da and ta-da right, and right. all of this. And as the animal trainer, I was like, I'm sorry, but we've got to spend time focusing on the animals. So we'd go back and forth, back and forth. And I think after a while, we kind of realized, you know, even though we might have slightly different philosophies about how we approach <laughs> Uh, he, he is actually a really good guy. So. He's a really good. He's a really good guy. You know, as uh, what she's mentioning because the entertainment program says, okay, how many shows are these today? We got to blend in dolphin shows and nine honor shows and kennel shows. We got to make sure it's a day where the guests have the optimum experience every day. But the trainer's perspective is, we want to make sure there's enrichment. And we want to make sure there's, there's all the health care and there's a husband training. All this stuff goes up. It's every day, and that happens every day. There's there's 24 hours of uh, care for animals. And my my role, and that is the life support systems and the water quality and the chemistry and and everything. It's 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 in it's in concert with each other, and it's twenty four hours a day. Um, it, uh, we have busy day. I mean, you can say we have busy days. Yeah. That all the uh, there's a lot of unseen things that go on during the day with animal care, and then the guests get that eight to ten hour window where it's just amazing and shows and and education and stuff. Like, and that uh, Sea World's morphed so many ways with uh, showing off the killer whales and dolphins and sea lions and everything in between the little, we have water tanks that are 50 gallons and we run 50 gallons. And we also have killer whale where we run 36,000 gallons a minute and all these things that, and everything in between it's yeah. a minute. A minute. Yeah. <laughs> we run 36,000 gallons of water a minute at killer whale. And that's under my, my watch every day. And then well, we, we have little, yeah, when I was lucky enough to be able to <clears> swim, <throat> swim with the whales back when uh, I can tell you, I, I so appreciated that water being so clear because my my first one of my first uh, positions in the animal training department was at the Dolphin Lagoon where yes. it was it in was the ocean bay water yeah and it it wasn't the cleanest <laughs> it, was still <laughs> yeah. so it wasn't like it was uh, you know because you guys still tested that water every day so you told yeah. us hey, it's okay everything's fine you know but you couldn't see very far in front of you so I definitely uh, appreciated the crystal clear water that we had at Killer Whale it's amazing because like oh, I've given this tour I've given this speech I'm about to give it's a three uh, that people think San Antonio Florida and Ohio at the time there were three Sea World parks and then our park in San Diego all those were man made saltwater parks because people here in Orlando, Orlando's 60 miles from the nearest source. So instead of digging a trench 60 miles long, you make man-made salt water. And in our position, we were right on Mission Bay, which is a uh, a man-made lagoon off of uh, San Diego Bay, San Diego, and, and the whole West Coast part of the Pacific Ocean. But the challenges are anything that's in the ocean could potentially end up in sea world. So my job is we immediately take care of that in the ocean incoming water and then we also have discharge in California. Everything's red tape and go this and that and EPA and blah, blah, blah. So there's rules of the water coming in. There's also more rules of the water going back out. So yes. um, I think going back out than it was coming. Ab in. Absolutely. Yes. But I, I will say that old lagoon was super enriching because I remember yeah. some of the animals coming up. They, they'd catch fish on their own. <laughs> One of them, Lester, Lester the dolphin came up with an octopus in his mouth. And wow. I, went down, I went down to reach to see if I could, if he would give it to me. He looks at me straight in the eye and he swallows the octopus. He goes, yep. <laughs> you take that delicacy from me? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's get into it. You know, Joan Embry was the face of animal ambassadors and talking about extinction and what we're doing as humans and how we're influencing the ecological system. And then she gets to a person in her life and she wants to retire. She lives in San Diego. I know her. I live about five minutes from her compound over in East County. Um, how does how does one go from you're a serial trainer and you're doing killer whales to going, you know what? I think Julie's the next face of global, not just statewide or citywide, but global animal ambassadorship and, and talking about animals throughout the world. You know, I, I actually, they, they sent out um, a notice or whatever saying if anybody wants to 
apply basically for that position. I never in a million years thought I would end up getting it, but I applied because I'm the type of person that always is, okay, let's, let's do it for the experience. Um, let me see, you know, what, what might happen or whatever. I mean, you know, I was frankly, yeah. and, and Bubba, this might be surprising to you. And, and if anybody else who knows me, but I'll, I'll, I will admit it that, um, even though I used to do shows every day at SeaWorld, it's very different working with animals and your focus is the animals. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was there. Um, and, and so, you know, I didn't mind being in front, plus you're doing a scripted show and all of that yeah. to speaking in front of the public extemporaneously type of thing, you know, very, very different. And I really don't like it. I still don't like it. <laughs> um, it, it's just, I'm, I'm a little bit more of an introvert than many, many people think, but so, so I also did it as a challenge, you know, so I just kind of did what they asked for. I think you had to put together a video or something like that, sent it in. And lo and behold, you know, a couple months later, well, a month later or so, they're like, you're in the finals. And I was like, really? Um, <laughs> and then, and then, um, yeah. ambassador you know so um so that's kind of how it all started and the first part of that was all being on jack's show and um and and then you know getting whatever tv shows they we had right. at the time we did some you know conan o'brien at the time and some daytime shows and things like that and then that all just kind of snowballed well yeah snowball is correct because you i mean we all knew you locally and then next thing you know a week later you're sitting on jay leno's show at tonight show and um what's the process like from because you're not going to take a kilowell but you're going to take a uh, kookaburra or a beaver oh my god a 20 dollars super chat from doris Karee. doris always so great watching your uh channel bubba thank you all. Hey, thanks, doris, doris thank you so I much know what that means i don't know what that means but thanks doris <laughs> so she put she put 20 dollars towards our show in the chat room ah oh well you know can i plug can i plug something else too absolutely I, uh, we'll go we'll go back to um to what you were asking, but I run an organization called Mission Wildlife and it's online. And we basically um, help organizations that save rescued and rehabilitated animals as well as endangered species anywhere in the world. And any any donation helps that as well. So I'm just gonna put that plug in right now because we're an all volunteer organization. So none of it is going to me, none of it is going to any of the people who run the organization or do any of the volunteer work. So that's uh, is there a link? So Bradley Jones or Chris and Rick, who are my moderators on the channel, can you guys find that link and put that link into the show chat, please? That would be great. That would be awesome. Thank what, you. Say the, say the name one more time. Mission Wildlife. Missionwildlife.com and, and the, org. the and the uh, the uh, the website is missionwildlifeconservation.org. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much for that, Bradley and Chris. You guys are awesome. Let's make sure we get that link in the chat. I'd be appreciated so much. So, so what's the process like? You're not going to take an underwater animal to a, a live talk show. Um, so, um, Bubba, that's that's a great question because when we first started. Uh, and we got the first segment on, let's, let's just say, The Tonight Show, right? Yeah. And The Tonight Show says, well, what can you bring? And so we're like, well, we've got an otter that can travel, and we've got, um, a, you know, um, one of the birds that can travel. We've got a penguin. Penguins travel. So we came up with, like, four or five animals that we did have at SeaWorld of San Diego that we knew could travel. Yeah. And, and and do these shows. And there's a couple of things that goes along with that. First is, you know, when we show up at the at the um, studio, our first time I asked for rehearsal time and they said, oh, we do rehearsal, you know, a few minutes before we go live or well, they weren't going live, but they tape. They basically tape live. Yeah. Um, and so I said, well, but I'd like the animals to see where we're going to be in a very relaxed setting. And I want to make sure that they're comfortable before we start yeah. uh, with a whole bunch of people around. And they actually said, wow, that's the first time anybody's ever asked us that. But they were very willing. They set up lunchtime with 
um, a person had to stay back and we brought out all the animals, gave them time to see what the set was like and all of that. And that became a ritual for yes. us every time. So the show, even though they never had to do that before or for anybody else, um, always set up rehearsal time for us just to desensitize and make sure the animals were comfortable because that was the most important thing. Um, so we, we took those animals and then they loved the segment and they called back in you know, a couple months and they said, OK, now we can bring. And we're like, hmm, uh, we're going to have to overcome this <laughs> because that was the stuff that we could bring, you know. <laughs> you know we, we start calling Bush Gardens, you know, what do you have that we can bring? And, and then that's also when, you know, I reached out to Moore Park College, which is the college that I went to for two years before I came here. Yeah. And they had, you know, I obviously had a um, relationship with the people who were there. They had a few animals that we could bring. And then I reached out to uh, David Jackson, who had an yes. organization called Conservation Ambassadors, and they had a few animals. So, so between um, all of these different resources, we ended up being able to then, you know, start start putting together a whole team, you know. Yeah, that, uh, and, and you, were a you had a regular segment on those shows. Maybe not every month, but maybe every other month you were always on the show. And we, we did we did the Tonight Show. Uh, we did the Tonight Show with Jay Leno, and and I I'm not a, a braggart. I hope I don't come across this way, but I, I am no. actually very proud of the fact that um, we are you know our messaging was good, our animals were phenomenal because they were always comfortable, um, and they would allow us to talk about just about anything. Like I could get serious yeah. on that show and talk about you know the needs for an endangered species and what people could do and all of yeah. that. It you know Jay could pull off the jokes and and the animals were always entertaining but i didn't need to do any of that lifting you know i could just talk about the animals and and be myself so we were on that show 65 times more than any wow. other person so we we were the most frequent guests wow. i know yeah that's quite a number and to say yeah. that that's a, um, because you're such a hit but, you know, somebody just made a comment. It was always about the animals. Talk about exposing the world, or at least nationally in the Jay Leno show, which become, you know, they're still syndicated. They still can go watch Jay Leno shows and see you on there. Um, but there's, it's just, the folks see Julian and Animal, but the support team behind the scenes with a tank or a cage or a setting and traveling from a, with a van to an L.A. show or an, potentially a New York show or even Jack Hanna show, it's the support team that nobody gets to see. Um, and and run. the number of trainers that came along, uh, you know, that's, from SeaWorld or from Bush Gardens or from other organizations, yeah. you know, we had at least one person for every animal. It was yeah. their trainer so that they, again, it was all about the animals being comfortable and they, so they knew that their trainer was there. I would mm -hmm. work with the animals uh, beforehand so that they knew who I was as well. If, yeah. if it was an animal that I didn't know already. Um, and so that everybody was comfortable when it came time. And that's why, Bubba, you couldn't tell that you right. know, there was a ton of people back there, you know, uh, helping out and making You know, it, 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 all the years, and I've heard this it's used all the time, is when you person like yourself or Ken Peters or Robin Sheets or people you know all the time, they call it developing relationships with your animal because it takes years of bonding and seeing that person or that animal every day. You know, I, I've, I've been around a long time and the, the amount of, work but like you said it's a passion those people it's a passion you know the, the guest sees that eight to ten hour block but the work that goes on behind 24 hours a day is we we just not i always go on tangents I, a bunch of us just wrote a bunch of testimonials to our corporate office for a project we were working on and it was an unbelievable read for me because we head of whales head of beluga whales and walruses and penguins and I wrote my testimony and I read them all like three or four times because it, it talked about the um, what they've experienced and how they work their day. And and it was never about them. It was about the, the animals that they work with. It was an unbelievable read. You, you, you'd be you'd be so proud of the people that you've left behind in the zero folks that still feel the same way you do now. Yeah. Yeah. And there are no more passionate people than the people who work with animals. I, yeah. I, I mean, bottom line, I think that it's because you're the one getting dirty and smelly and stinky and working yeah. overtime and late and making sure everything is right for the animals. My motto always was the animals always come first. 
Yeah. And, um, and that's why, you know, I stayed at SeaWorld uh, all those years because I was confident that, you know, if you needed a veterinarian immediately, it would, they would be there immediately. If yes. you, you know, if you needed to watch an animal for 24 hours, you, you know, you could get staff to watch that animal and get, you know, I mean, there was no question about, oh, we don't have enough money to pay this person to do this right. or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was just, what do you need to make sure the animals are well taken care of? Correct. The animal come first mantra is still there to this day. Um, that is what guides us every single day. You know, yes, there's the guest side. Yeah. But nothing happens if it's going to infringe upon an animal's well-being. Nothing. You know, that always comes first in any decision-making process, which I'm glad you said it that well, because you say it so well. Um, so you've been around the world. What are some of the craziest, or in your opinion, you've been everywhere, right? You've traveled the world. You still do ambassador work for that. You talk about your mission wildlife. I know you and Jack Han have been some crazy places in Africa. And I mean, I, can you talk about some of the most interesting or in your opinion, interesting places you've been? Uh, well, yeah, every every place was interesting. I think um, you know, I I first went to Africa with filming with Jack, and it became. I mean, I it, it's my soul. It's where my soul hangs out right now. You know, I cannot wait to get back to Africa. Every year I try to go. Um, I bring groups there. So any place in Africa was like so totally special with Jack. It was amazing. In yeah. fact, Jack really spoiled. Uh, how I travel. And it, luckily I was, I was very young uh, again. Well, I wasn't as young, as, <laughs> but, but I, was, I was pretty young when I started traveling with him and he spoiled the way that I perceive how travel should happen rather mm. than being an observer uh, with Jack and filming. And we did a segment for SeaWorld and Bush Gardens. So we're, we're immersing ourselves in the work that is happening in whatever place mm -hmm. we were going to. So it wasn't about just watching somebody do something or watching the animals. It was about participating, talking about it, filming it, uh, helping whatever situation might be, you know, for uh, needing to, um, you know, take part in a rescue or a release in some cases, you know, it was amazing that we got to do that in, in, in some of the cases overseas. Um, so that part of it was really special. Um, but then there was the other side with Jack as well, which you know how crazy he was, right? Yeah. So, so I've met him many, many places. times. Yeah. Uh, I, we stayed for a couple of nights on a place at a place called Goat Island in Australia. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it was aptly named, not just because there might have been goats on the island, but because if you think about the worst place you've ever stayed in your entire life, oh my gosh, it, it was worse <laughs> than that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and and yet, you know, what a what a fun time. And and Jack and Su his wife Susie were there, and they they just you know like took it all in stride, didn't even blink at anything. And yet, you know, I'm I'm outside, you know, like the first one braving brave enough to take a shower, you know, because. It was a hose stuck in the top of some old, you know, like shower thing that was taken outside, you know, and, <laughs> and inside the, the shower place, I don't think anybody had taken a shower there for years because there's a huge spider like this big. Uh, in the corner, there was a bird nest in the uh, in the place where uh, you put the soap, you know, and, and I just went in there so fast and just like turned on the water, and goes, like this, you know, and I was like, OK, I feel better because it was literally like 110. Uh, so, I mean, I just felt like, OK, I need to get in there and take a shower. Um, and then and then I mean, it was just the whole experience was was just kind of funny but amazing and uh, i you know my heart my heart goes out to jack and susie and family uh because of the situation that um jack and susie are facing and and uh, so um yeah you know it was it was uh, phenomenal times wow you know i couldn't imagine trading places with you because I've, I've known you for so long and every time there's that one <laughs> it's, it's, it's Ellen's Sunday uh, girl day, so she goes coffee and breakfast with her girlfriend. So, um, but I couldn't imagine trading places with you because you know there's the work life, and um, you know you mentioned earlier, Sea World is a is um is a different place. To, it's a different place where it's, it's pretty special, you know, and getting to do because I never thought I was a college baseball player and I got a job because I got hurt in college and I go 
what am I going to do with my life? And I never thought I'd be doing water quality and animal life support. And I never thought I'd be there for 39 plus years. And now I'm retiring from there. And did you ever think in your wildest dreams that I love animals? I love horses. I played, I played toys with the little guys that you get to do, which I mean, who, who writes that script? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think back because literally I can't believe that almost every aspect of what I did. So first of all, I swam in the water with killer whales, which is kind of like being an astronaut, you know, like yeah. how many people get a chance to do that. And now how many people, I mean, it's, probably not going to happen, never. Um, you know, so, so to have that experience and have been on the nose of a killer whale who's pushing you through the water to feel yeah. that power, to just know that you're, you're tr the trust between animal and person uh, and that you, you talked about relationship and how important that relationship is. Um, it's still important today, but when we got in the water with those animals, it was critical. I mean, obviously that was something that, that told you, you know, is this a good time? Uh, how, you know, what's, what the mood of the animal is in and all of that. So, I mean, just going through that was phenomenal. And I would have said, man, that's, that's a career right there in and of itself. Yeah. But then I got to take animals and um, go on to Jay Leno. And then I got to travel with Jack all around the world. And then, you know, I mean, I, I you know, I just, I just, um, I think of all the things that I had the opportunity to do and I'm just so thankful and grateful. Mm. And um, I, I'm, I'm very appreciative to every person who I worked with at SeaWorld, um, even going back to the Anheuser-Busch days, yeah. uh, it was it was amazing having uh, August and Ginny, um, you know, have this program that we built with Ambassador Animals as a front and center program, and uh, and I and I truly truly enjoyed um, all of those years and every aspect of it. You know, Mom, Pocky, uh, uh, Teresa just said you can see her passion for animals. What a fun career! Great interview. Judith DeMaio wrote with all the relationships that are formed. Now, what we haven't talked about was SeaWorld has a, an, an unbelievable rescue program. We're already in the 40, 44th, I think it's 44,000 animals we've rescued. We've had situations um, where we've had the El Nino situation on the West Coast where um, it was, this was pre-COVID and I was been around for that, where typically on a beached animal where sea lions, first time moms will abandon their babies because then, oh my God, I have a baby, what do I do? And we'll get a couple 300 a year well, during an El Nino, we got 2,000 one year, and like right off the bat. And we modified the entire west end of the park to support 2,000 animals when you normally get 200. Yeah. And the amount of care, we flew, we flew in trainers from Texas and Florida and, and worked 24 hours a day. And and she mentions it. And then get, because the, the goal is to get those back in their natural environment. And it happened by the thousands. And But with the USDA input and the, uh, fish and game who make decisions on those things. There's a whole concerted effort to do exactly what Judas just said there, get them back to their environment and sea world. And it wasn't a thing where you cared about the money. It was the right thing to do. Sea world didn't oh, care about well, money. It was, it was a huge, huge expense to, to yes. do that. It still is. I mean, the yes. rescue and rehab program for years wasn't even known or wasn't even right. talked about. It was just something that. SeaWorld and, and all the people who are there, I mean, we have the knowledge to be able to help these animals. Correct. Of course you're going to help those animals. And nobody ever really talked about it. And then all of a sudden it was kind of like, well, you know, we have a rescue and rehab program. And then, all, you know, you have those years where the thousands of them, I, I volunteered because like you said, yeah. uh, you know, we needed extra help. And I tell you, it was, uh, it was, it was definitely eye opening because I, you know, you go back there, you see the rescued animals and you see even when you have hundreds, but when there were thousands of them, thousands all the extra pools that you guys set up. And then I, I went in and helped because they'd have to feed, they'd have maybe, um, 300 animals in, in one area and yeah. you have to feed each one of them and then make sure that you knew which ones. And so there was a whole system that the rescue team set yes. up where yes. uh, once you, once you helped, you know, and got that one fed, you actually moved it 
on the other side of a barrier. And by the time you got all the animals on this side fed and over. Over to the other side of the barrier, <laughs> you had to start prepping for the next meal because you had, right. had to go right. back in for the next meal, you know. So, um, but uh, those animals were just, I mean, it was so amazing to be able to see those animals get healthy, get fat, and get released back out in the wild. I have so much respect, so much admiration no. for the rescue folks because not only did they have the hard work and uh, the uh, you know the amazing results that they got, but they did have to also deal with the emotional side of not everyone can make it. Obviously, correct. Yeah, for, for, you know, um, standing for a reason. Yeah. And, um, and I, I tell you, I don't know that I would have the emotional fortitude to be able to do that, um, as a, you know, as an everyday yeah, job, it's so tough. I, I, you know, my head has always been off. My, my heart is always, uh, full of gratitude for the people who take that on. Yeah. You know, we'll bring up one high profile rescue, JJ, the gray whale, um, when we, when she stranded and they brought her into the park and I remember this day they brought her in, she was about just a young guy, um, a female, I remember female or male, male, female. Yeah. Yeah. And she was only eight feet long. But, and when we put her in one of the back pools in the back, um, they grow so fast, you know, they're eating. And by the time we released her, she was over 20 feet long. And we moved her from a back pool to the on display pool, which is called Kilowell uh, close up pool. And then they released her. It was like, almost like an aircraft carrier that had to get uh, release her back to the wild. And I mean, they have these things because they're, they they grow so fast that the skin pops and regrows and pops and regrows. And they were feeding her hundreds and hundreds of pounds of then zero developed a, a natural formula that would mimic what a mom would give a baby calf. Um, the science behind all this, you know, yeah, we're feeding the whale, but the science behind feeding that whale is incredible. And our veterinary staff and all of the, I remember the JJ well, team, uh, it was yeah. crazy. And there were even, there were scientists from a lot of different places that wanted to come and study uh, that growth and, yeah. and see what happened. And, and we even, um, uh, and I will say the animal care team basically, you know, came up with ways like uh, gray whales feed off the bottom. You know, they're, they're, they scoop up food yeah. off the bottom. So um, near after she was eating on her own and not, you know, needing the bottle and all of that, they started just putting you know, hundreds of pounds of food on the bottom of the pool so that she could do what she would normally be doing out in the wild so that yeah. that could prepare her for, for being able to survive out there. I just, uh, it, it, it's, it's an amazing to think. I, I've, I've gotten to see it every day for 39 plus years. You got to see it for, you know, a couple of decades. <laughs> I, but um, I, I was there for about as long as you were. So exactly. I a couple of years, but if you put it all together, it was almost 40 years. You yeah. know, our mods have shared your link, Mission Wildlife Conservation. They've, they've been sharing your link in the chat, which is great. Awesome. But, you know, you've retired from zero. You're not in the TV circuit anymore, but you're still doing it. You're still doing Mission Wildlife. You're still heavily involved because it's, a, like you said, it's a passion. And you can, like they said, you can tell that Julie is, speaking her truth because it's still in, you can tell in your voice that you're still passionate about it. Oh yeah. I mean, and, you know, working for animals, meaning working for the benefit of animals and their welfare and um, species and their survival. Uh, it's, it's just who I am. So there's no, mm. like, there's no retiring from that, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's just how do I, how do I do it now versus how did I do it yeah. uh, when I was getting paid to do it, you know? And, yeah. and, and now I, you know, I'm finding those ways, you know, whether it's on teaching, um, I'm on the, uh, advisory board of the emerging wildlife conservation leaders. And we, we mentor the people who are coming up in the conservation field and give them the skills that they need. Mm. Um, I'm on the board of the uh, national Marine mammal foundation. Um, so that, you know, we're, we're taking on a lot more in terms of, um, conservation projects and the group at the national Marine mammal foundation it's just incredible because it's it, they're led by uh, veterinarians. They're the ones who went down after the oil spill in the Gulf. Mm. Uh, after the um, what was that called? The, the Prince William Sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the B uh the, um, the and, uh, BP the BP oil yeah, spill. Yeah, the BP BP spill. 
Um, but they, I mean, they've done work for since that spill happened and discovered that the dolphins that were affected by that oil spill, you know, we stopped thinking about it after they clean it up, clean it up yeah. or whatever, you know, and after we're, you know, 10 years later, the data shows that those animals are severely impacted health wise. Mm. So are their calves. So, I mean, you know, there's so much information out there and, you know, it's a great thing that we have organizations like National Marine Mammal Foundation that has the expertise to be able to go and get the data to make it known what happens after oil spills yeah. that impacts these animals decades later and, yeah. and is still impacting them, their reproduction, reproductive success, and even their calves, um, you know, ability to thrive. You know, the human uh, impact on uh, the ecological system, we have, a, she had to mention this too, but I'll mention this now, Eric Ochin and uh, uh, Keith Yip run our whale entanglement program um, where, we, you know, there's crab pots and netting and all this kind of stuff to get sustainable food for human beings, but they impact the global life. We have, uh, at a moment's notice, Eric Ochin gets a call, hey, there's a whale stranded, he's got three crab pots wrapped around his tail in the LA Harbor, boom, he, I mean, and he's my boss. He's gone within 10 minutes. There's already a Zodiac set up on a back of a ship, a back of a truck driving to LA Harbor, and they're out there cutting nets off of whales. Mm -hmm. And that happens because of one phone call because somebody, hey, there's a whale struggling. Um, that's that's a program that's already out there. Um, and that's a the, dangerous the, job too. You know, dangerous. I mean, and you have to know what you're doing in order to do yeah. that. And that's why there's only, you know, a, a handful of people. A handful. And that's that's, that's a lot. To do yeah. That. yeah. 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 The uh, we were we responded. I remember uh, Loyan Dubois responded to the penguin spill over in the Galapagos, right? Yeah, they had a, uh, no, no, it was actually she went to South Africa, South Africa, uh, that's right, South Africa. Uh, it was, and they developed, and it's so funny, they developed a cleaning process with palm, palm liquid soap was effective by getting oil off of feathers. Yeah, Don, 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 Don detergent. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was during the Exxon Valdez up in, up North that yeah. Hubs SeaWorld research did the study and found that, uh, you know, Don dishwashing detergent was actually the most effective thing for, uh, yeah. oil. And uh, apparently it still is today because people are yes, still, still today. It. So, yeah. It's an S that's a written SOP with using that product. It's amazing. And, the uh, the, they've, I don't want to say they perfected, but they have, in a sense, perfected response. And that's all with zero's input. It's crazy about how much you know, impact we've made just in our guest experience, but globally as far as protecting animals. I mean, I'm so fascinated talking to you today. It's so fun to talk to you and share share your story. What do you, anything you want to say that's um, that besides what you said? What's your what's your big words of wisdom to our viewers today? Um, you know, I think that with all that's going on in the world, uh, obviously there are huge issues with wars and poverty and, mm. uh, and, and all of that. And so there's a lot to worry about, you know, and, and politics even here in the United States becomes this huge issue. But to me, bottom line still is all of that's not going to matter if we don't have a world that we can even live in. Um, and, and so to me, that comes to doing what I can on a daily basis to make sure that I'm making a positive impact. And that relates to both animals and just the environment in general. But that's also why I'm so driven to, um, to not only do my part to help other organizations do whatever mm. they can in the area that they have expertise. So, you know, like through Mission Wildlife, we uh, support an organization in Kenya that um, works hand in hand with the local community called, they're called the Waso lions, the local community to realize that the lions in their area uh, were decreasing because it wasn't really known by the local people that the lion population had decreased to the point where they were disappearing. Wow. And that having lions is still super important to the environment, the balance of everything, um, to tourism, generally speaking, you know, and bringing in income to Kenya and all of that. So they've done a phenomenal job of bringing together all the local communities along with government, you know, making sure that the population uh, is remaining as safe as possible. And the lion population has 
uh, blossom to, you know, over nice. from, like, from like 10 animals to over 50. And they used to not be prides. And now there's prides of lions again in this in this area. And uh, and they're just, you know, it's like these types of organizations. It's a, it's a small organization. Nobody would know who they are, you know. Yeah. But it's a small organization that is making a huge difference um, in the area where they work. And those are the types of organizations that we can, uh, you know, that we're raising money for, that we give support to, because they're the experts in helping the place that they're taking care of in the world. Mm. And then we also help local San Diego, you know, rescue organizations um, and, and, you know, even conservation ambassadors who gives homes to rescued animals that can't be returned to the wild. Um, yeah. So there's so many different ways that each one of us can help in our own way that make that, that means something to each of us. And, you know, Bubba, just by doing your shows, you know, you're giving back, you're spreading the mm. word and, and making sure people hear different, you know, views and, and, and different, aspects of, of life, you know, and, and this is mine and it'll always be mine. You know, animals are just my passion and, and that's never going to change. Well, I appreciate that. And, and, and you add me to your commentary, which is humbling to begin with, because, you know, I'm all about, you know, my, my regular viewers know it's about getting people to see every perspective. And, and we've had you on, we've had coaches, we've had um, single parents who have gone through struggles and um, this whole thing. And um, it's just, I love people, you know, I, I love sharing the human experience and because we all have a different path and and um, it helps. I, I, I don't want to get emotional in front of you, Julie, because I think you're a long time, but it's okay. Um, it's okay. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but we all have value. And I've said this before, the guy who has a dollar and the guy who needs a dollar, everybody has value. And if we all thought that way, I had to imagine how great the world would be. And then the reciprocal effect of that value affects animals or uh, communities or environments or whatever. I mean, I'm just so glad to share your story. I know people have known you from your, your time on TV and stuff, but to get to see you face to face and, and you're not just pitching a story for a TV show. You're, you're, you're talking about it because you've lived it and you still, and you're passionate about it too. I'm so happy to have you on the show today. And, um, any closing words? I can't tell you how appreciative I am today. Uh, it's just a pleasure to to talk with you. I hadn't seen you in a, in a while. But yeah, it's been a while. Just one last thing. I, I'm just going to pitch again is uh, we, we do events every year for Mission Wildlife to raise money. And for any uh, car lovers, keep, keep uh, a lookout in the next month or so on our website because we're going to be doing a car show, an auto show for the very first time. Mm. But of course, it'll be really unique because we'll have animals there. Uh, you know, we'll be doing some auctions and things like that. Oh, and speaking of animals, here comes Ma, one of mine. Oh, yeah, oh she was going to bring this. It was a surprise. This is a surprise for all you guys. This is so cool. Great, <laughs> All right. Hang on just a second. All right. Hey. <laughs> hi, Brisbane. You want to wave? Hi. Wave to everybody. Oh, he said hi. Come on. Wave. Hi. You just want to say hi? Okay. <laughs> this is awesome. Hi. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> he's normally like a super big personality. And now he's being all like, I'm being all shy. <laughs> Aren't you being shy? Yes. Are you being shy? Uh, what's, in the, what's his name? This is Brisbane, like the city Brisbane. in Australia. Oh, okay. Yeah. What you doing? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like he's like a he's 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 twenty four years old, but he's like wow. a, he's like a two year old because they never grow past that stage of <laughs> of just oh, okay. to cause chaos and uh, and not take any responsibility. <laughs> 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 Isn't that right? Yes. Isn't that right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Brisbane. Thank you, Julie, for coming out today. Hi. Everybody in the chat, appreciate all support. Uh, we have one more uh, interview next week with the Spanglish Fund, uh, Vanessa. And then we go on a month-long break. Ellen and I, are, as you guys know, we're traveling to New Zealand and Australia in about a week and a half. And we're going to meet one of our viewers, Kimbo the Kiwi, in Auckland, New Zealand. We're going to see a bunch. We're going to try to document our entire vacation with you guys and show you a bunch of live streams. Trying to go live from Australia at least once. We have a tour of the Sydney Harbor and the uh, Sydney Opera House on a jazz tour. Um, a lot of fun coming up on the channel and then we'll get back in the let's meet series in May. We have a local baker that still wants to show her product. We still have a bunch of people who want to join in 
Julie, thank you so much for today. Great to see you again. Thanks for telling Thanks, your story. Bubba. It was a pleasure. Great to meet. Well, you know, meet everybody out there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everybody have a great, great week coming up. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Got the green on, guys. Have a I great got, Sunday. I change. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, Julie. Good. Thanks, Bubba. Bye-bye. Bye. That was so awesome.